What is up, everybody? It is Monday, July 19 at 2 p.m. here in sunny Florida. I am on vacation at the beach. That's why you see these lovely different surroundings. It's going to be very awkward when I'm looking at my tiny computer screen down here like this. So half the time you'll be looking at the top of my forehead, which I know you guys like because everybody looks at likes to look at the top of a hat. So a few caveats here. One, this place has no internet, basically. It's been down for two days. So you are seeing me live stream tethered to my phone. So one, we will pray that Verizon can tolerate the heavy load of my massive, huge live stream. Uh, number two, you ask, hey, you're on vacation. Uh, get out of your hotel room, go to the beach. Well, two things. One, my son is taking a nap in the next room. He's two, so somebody has to sit here. Perfect timing for me to be here. And three, I'm going to be honest. So... I'm, I'm on the Gulf Coast of Florida. It's beautiful, crystal blue water and white sands and, you know, absolutely epic and gorgeous. But the caveat, there's this thing you guys might not know about. First of all, the Gulf is disgusting. All I think about when I go anywhere near the Gulf of Mexico is uh, oil spills. We got a lot of those. Had one recently. Um, dead animals, red tide, and flesh-eating bacteria. Those are things basically the Gulf of Mexico and Florida is famous for. The flesh-eating bacteria gets like nine people a year. You're like, oh, I've got like a little scratch. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, we're removing your left arm, right leg, and two of your nostrils. So that's bad. Um, red tide is an algae that kills things. So you're like, oh, man, this beach is beautiful. And you're walking down it, finding these gorgeous conch shells. And then there's like 17 dead eels eels there's dead eels everywhere dead fish everywhere not great my daughter told me that the most dangerous species of eel which is the ones that are on the beach she's sick she told me they're called harmless eels and i was very very disappointed in uh, her lack of knowledge of the english language so yeah so basically i'm perfectly happy up here while everybody else down there huffs and puffs because of the red tide algae in their lungs the oil spills that they're breathing and the dead fish that are banging against their ear holes so anyways the market the market kind of dipping but really still kind of above support with epic bearishness and saltiness it would seem which is pretty good time which is good time uh, and I don't really see why, but you know, I'm a very positive person, infectiously positive, if you will, it's hard to get me down in life almost ever. So I don't see so much bad happening. I should mention to you guys, listen, I never talk about them. They sponsor my newsletter. Uh, let me find the thingy. Here's the thingy, the thingy. There's the thingy, um, Femex. So the reason I'm going to tell you about them today, um, is that they're giving, the markets are slow. Obviously, they're giving away $1,200 to anyone who deposits a Bitcoin or more. So they've upped massively the amount of bonus you get for a deposit up to $1,200. Absolutely incredible. So you can check that out. So anyways, now that we've established red tide, harmless eels, um, oil spills, and all of the reasons that the Gulf of Mexico is an absolutely rancid and disgusting place, let's take a look at Bitcoin. Like I said, I'm going to be looking down. It's going to be weird. Look at the top of my head. I'm also drinking. So I'm on vacation. Uh, I ripped the thing, but uh, nice Stella Artois. Or as Americans call it, a Stella Artois. Stella Artois. All right, let's share the stream. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing your comments. Is Tether FUD legit? I didn't even know there was Tether FUD. So I'm not quite sure. Uh, anyways, here we go look at the weekly first okay so of note these are things that are probably worth taking a look at first of all as we know one two three four five six seven eight candles in a row basically held the 50 percent retracement of 3800 up to 65,000. right you can see that those are the fibs pulling all the way down from this 3858 low march 2020 when the market died black thursday if you will so as you can see, we zoom in here. We have, first of all, the 50 MA is of note because that has been held and we have not lost that since May. We have not lost that since that time and it was recaptured in May of 2020. So we basically have been above the 50 MA on the weekly since that time. If you're an MA trader, these do work a little better on larger time frames because I think a lot of people watch them. That said, it held it as support and we're only below it for the first 
uh, 14 hours of the week. So this could close easily above just like this did here, right? At a time, this was trading down here at 28.8 below that. So this is something definitely worth watching. Now, the 50% level is not a Fibonacci level. I can't stress this enough. Everybody always pulls it as fibs. You hear people talking about them as fib levels, but they're not. 50% level is called the Dow level. People have been using it in the stock market forever, hence the name the Dow level, like the Dow Jones. It's a place that traders in legacy markets love to put orders in to concentrate on. So not a Fibonacci level, doesn't have the spirals of the nature and the clouds and the seashells and the snowflakes of Fibonacci's. Right, not a Fibonacci level. But the area that you do tend to see assets retrace to when they go for a much more massive retracement is this area, right? 61.8 down to like 65%-ish. That's called the golden pocket based on the golden ratio of Fibonacci. And uh, so that would be down here, you know, 25 to 27, something like that. So that's an area I think a lot of people will be watching now. Now that's different than how far it's retraced from the top, right? Because there's a retracement of the move from 3,800. So you're not starting at zero, starting 3,800. So how far it dips from the top is a different concept than what we are discussing here. So basically on the weekly, we'll be looking to see if we can close above this 50 MA here and to see what will happen with this candle right now. Uh, let's look at this first. Uh, I don't even got my charts in order. I was struggling to get all this shit set up, by the way, because I've got like wires and I had to get a power strip from the people downstairs and the camera and there's a light. And, uh, I do these things for you. I love you guys. Love you guys. So here, listen, I'm still looking at the same thing. I haven't even looked at MACD. That's crossing down, but not too bad. Uh, I see this massive blue descending channel, which is just not bearish to me, right? All about time frame when you talk about bullish and bearish. Clearly, we are generally in a bearish trend since 65K, no question. Everything below 42K is bearish, in my opinion. Not if you zoom out far enough. But I think you all know I've been clear enough, hopefully by now, that I don't see anything particularly bullish in the chart until we're back above 42K when talking about the more immediate price action. But that said, this is a very clear channel. Uh, down, up. Well, or you could even say up, down, down, up, down, right? Alternating, that's what you want. Two up, two down. Very strong EQ. Like, look how often the EQ was support here and then flipped and it's resistance now. So listen. This channel should break to the upside, but that does not mean price can't come tap the bottom of it, right? And the further that goes, the lower that becomes. Totally possible. Nothing wrong with that. The only problem is that that will be starting to break the range lows if you're talking about the sideways range, right? Which is this thing, right? This range really, I view the lows as around 30,000. I had, uh, if you guys missed it on Friday, it was great. I had big cheds in crypto bourbon. Burb believes that the lows here that are significant are the 28,500. So he thinks that above this wick, everything remains pretty bullish and nothing to worry about. I tend to think that that was a sweep of these lows and this is still the significant level. Either way, we're holding it, right? And you can see on the four hour, we've just been trading in the bottom half of this range below the EQ here, around 36,000 since kind of the 20, well, it was reject. We've been trading below it since 18th of June. Vacation, vacation. So this is still holding. It's swept below, but actually we're right at support on this uh, red channel right here, which is really interesting. But to start talking about 42, first we got flip 36, right? It gets really, really awkward. We're, we're definitely in the range lows, but until that's completely broken, I don't see anything bad. Now, what's most of note to me? Okay, this is, uh, I like to pull up a line chart, of course. I tell you guys that all the time. When I'm looking for divergences, it eliminates the noise of wick, no wick. Because then you're comparing apples to apples. RSI is calculated on the close of a candle and line charts are just reflective of closes. So look, very clearly, potential, potential, not confirmed, bullish divergence. Man, get out of here. I'm doing this on a tiny little laptop. Super annoying, right? That's a higher low. This was actually, some would have said this was a confirmed bullish divergence here. I don't think so. I don't think that RSI curve is enough, but we have that potentially. More importantly, let's go down. 12 hours, lower low, potentially higher low, depending on where it closes. So that has to close higher and then make an elbow up. So nothing convincing here. I'm just showing you what I'm watching. Oh my God. I wrote potential bullish divergences on multiple time frames on Twitter. That was it. I didn't say time to get long, huge signal, whatever. People went bananas as if I had said like, this is the bottom and was making calls. It's unbelievable. Six hour, 
very clear potential bullish divergence, right? Four hour. Oh, four hour. Very clear potential bullish divergence, right? Right now, if it closed at 30,794 or higher, I would call that confirmed with that elbow up. I haven't even looked at lower time frames. There was one there, you know, here, from here to here. Clear bullish divergence oversold. It's literally everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's just not oversold. That's the thing. Like 12 hour hasn't gotten down to oversold. Actually, yeah, 12 hour went to oversold and never made it to overbought. Totally fine. Daily oversold, never made it to overbought, building further bullish divergence. I am not a pansy, so I'm not scared. Uh, like Bone Crusher, when I, what's the word? I ain't never scared. What? I ain't never scared. What? To the club, and I think I'm a punk, so I go for the Lord of the sit on the trunk. I done told you about, I ain't never scared. What? Yeah, y'all know. Bone Crusher. Never scared. I don't see a reason to be scared. I don't see a reason to be scared. Might go down further. Uh, eventually it's going to go up. So I'm going to come over and check out your guys' comments, which means I have to look down here. Really weird. I can't. Uh, when I'm outside of the club and you think I'm a punk. Yeah. Can't go. go for the loaded tank. Nine that's up in the trunk. Yeah. Right. Got it. I had to remember that for a while. Um, 25, 28 would be the bottom that much I'm confident of. I don't know if you mean it's going to happen again because it already did basically, right? I mean, we were already at 28, almost. So yeah, maybe a little. Uh, this is complete nonsense from someone who's never worked at a bank or a fund. Thank you for sharing. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, also, I okay, what's it? it's an idea. If you change the color of your candle, it's kind of hard to see the different colors. I, I've talked about this before. There's a reason that I use these candle colors. A, because I don't like Christmas. And those are green and red. I'm just kidding. It has nothing to do with Christmas. It's great. Um, but it does make you think of Christmas. Red is a triggering color, right? So I found that in the past, if I had green and red candles like everyone else, that when I used a red candle, it made me more emotional when I would see a price drop. So I went to find the coolest two most neutral colors that I could find that I could tolerate looking at on my charts, and I used blue and gray, Right. Right. I have not had for someone who said I've had a few. This is my first. This is my first and only view right now. Um, but the most important thing, honestly, of the day is that uh, Future Unchanged is here and he's here. He's joined us. Um, and I'm going to start. Yeah, the stream with Bourbon Chad was awesome. I'm going to start doing more collaborations like that for sure. Most Fridays, although I will be off uh, this week. Um, Scott, why are you so happy and smiling with your guests and straight face and monotone on your live streams? Your father, who's straight face and monotone? I just sang uh, the thing. The but that's our cat. You're being sarcastic. Yeah, you're you're, you're uh, sarcastic. Hey, let's take a look at some news. I pulled up some news stories, um, and I didn't get to do that today. Let's take a look at this. So is that coming up there? Now, this is the news of the day, right? Bitcoin unmoved as Grayscale unlocks 1 billion shares. If only there was someone out there who said the GBTC narrative was farkin' stupid. Nobody cares. GBTC unlocked coins all the time. Look at all these unlocks. Why all of a sudden do we care about this unlock? Why? Why? Anybody? Why? Because price is down, so people need shit to panic about. Nobody cares about grayscale unlocks. There's no reason that just because there's a negative funding that people that there's a discount that people would start panic selling the minute that their coins unlocked. It's been a stupid narrative. It's just something for everyone to talk about. And I love how you're like Twitter's like everybody's holding their breath for the grayscale unlock. <gasps> right? Were you holding your breath for the grayscale unlock? Did you expect? that all of a sudden we were going to see explosive volume yesterday, the minute those coins unlocked, it's done. It's done. So guess what, guys? Nothing's happened. Price has drifted down slowly alongside stonks, apparently. BTC volatility reaches one-year low on top of negative funding rates and premium. Okay, so one thing we know is that when volatility reaches historic or one-year low, eventually, could be a month, could be a day, we're going to see a massive move. Massive move. Now, if it's down, my guess would be that it would be pushing down like a huge candle, but would bounce very hard. If it's up, uh, pray, praise, 
praise the crypto gods and we'll all be extremely excited um, that we're so rich. But uh, negative funding rates for ages here at a premium, usually when there's a long term negative funding rates, you're going to see that get squeezed and price is going to go up just like we saw leverage liquidated all the way down. I don't think you guys can appreciate no, some of you probably can. You're, you're pretty smart. But the level of impact that the amount of leverage in this system had on the drop, right? From 60 to 50,000 basically liquidated a million people. $10 billion, a million individual traders, 850,000, give or take. And the same from 40 to 30,000, right? So those people piling in on shorts, very good chance they get squeezed the other way. This headline, I didn't even read the article. Classic, right? Share the article, didn't even read it. It's what you guys do, right? Bitcoin falls below 31,000 as COVID resurgence fears hurt both stocks and crypto. Just like you know, okay, we've got, I don't know, a few hundred thousand. I don't know how many people are here. I can't see. How many of you are selling your stocks in Bitcoin right now because of COVID? A lot? Probably not, right? Narratives. All we get from the media are stupid narratives. Nobody is selling their Bitcoin because of a fear of COVID resurgence. Stupid. Oh, look at these people. Look at her. She wants to retire by 35. And this guy, he never wants to retire. That's an ad. Robin Hood says Krypton trading slump could weigh on future revenues. Duh. Robin Hood's trying to go public. Huge valuation. Can't remember what it was. 35 billion, something like that. And, uh, Basically make all their money by selling your order flow and of late on when moon doge, right? Crypto and crypto is dropping and it's going to hurt Robinhood just like it has. We saw from May to June a 50% reduction in trading volume on exchanges. Absolutely massive. And I think we will continue to see the same. Now, there is a famous statement in markets, sell in May and go away. Probably never more true than after people have been literally locked up in their houses for a year. Right. I mean, I could tell you, I don't want to be doing much besides sitting on the beach, uh, getting a really bad cough from red tide being attacked by harmless eels, much like you guys. But nobody wants to be sitting around trading right now. That really does affect volume. Put that with the slump. This is what you get. Now, this is massive. Binance burns 390 million in BNB, implying 2 billion QG profits. So, They've pledged to burn tokens equal to 20% of their quarterly profits, and they burned $390 million. Now, keep in mind, the second quarter of uh, the year ends in June, right? So January, February, March, April, May, June. So this is April, May, June. Obviously, there was huge, huge, huge moves in that time. $2 billion in three months. $2 billion finance. $2 billion. Billion dollars. Crypto community argues on Bitcoin capacity as a hedge against inflation. Yet again, didn't read the article, just saw the stupid headline and thought, hmm, are we really arguing whether Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation based on price action for a month? Right? Do you buy something as a hedge against inflation, expecting it to hedge against inflation within 30 days? No, you buy something as a hedge against inflation in the Michael Saylor tradition or the Paul Tudor Jones forever. You buy it because you know that your cash over the next 50 years will continue to lose value, not because of the next month. So anyone who's arguing that Bitcoin has failed as an inflation hedge based on the fact that it's dropped from 65 to 30 doesn't understand anything about shit or anything. And that, you know what? That was mean. That was mean. Because there might be people that I don't know who I really respect who said that. And then I'm going to be walking it back and I'm going to say shit. But like, that's dumb. It's just dumb. It's dumb. And finally, JP Morgan. It's on a blockchain hiring spree. JP Morgan, led by Jamie Dimon, who said that Bitcoin, that he actually said that it was basically the worst thing in the world, that he would fire any employee on the spot that he found out was even trading it with their own personal money. Of course, that means they're on a blockchain hiring spree and allowing their richest, wealthiest customers to trade Bitcoin, right? Watch what they do, not what they say. All right, so coming back to the comments. You have to look at the top of my head. So um, it's been a bearish eternity. When will it stop? Dude, it's been like eight weeks. It's been like eight weeks. And what's funny is that, like, if you went back a year, July 2020, 
what was the price of Bitcoin in July 2020? Eight grand, something like that. Blah, 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 blah. July, July 2020. Yeah, $9,000. If I told you a year ago that Bitcoin would be $30,000 today, would you be bearish at $30,000? No, no. No, it's all about perspective. If Bitcoin had never gone to 65 and had just slowly climbed to 30, we'd all be literally like having bacchanalian orgies on the red tide beach down here out of excitement. It's all about perspective and zooming out, but we've been bearish literally from the most like exuberant highs of all time for eight weeks, nine weeks, nine weeks. It's not an eternity. It's literally nothing. We will start looking bullish again in the fall. Everyone needs to have an ounce of patience. Sure, who cares? Whatever. Yes, it's been a long eight weeks. It's been a long eight weeks. Been a, a long eight weeks. Yes, red tide orgies. It's a thing in the, in Florida. It's Florida. Um. St- yeah, let's uh, do some Bone Thugs and Harmony crossroads. My wife uh, did that at karaoke one time and nailed every word. The only part of that's all I love is like, yeah, I miss my uncle Charles. Y'all want to be going for his home. Home to lean on, lean on, lean on. And we pray and we pray. I just think he misses his uncle Charles. That's really nice. Um, let's see. Bear, bear flag for me on low tie frame after the last drop this morning. Pretty weak indication. But like you said, still range on high tie frame. Bears will need a hard push down and close to invalidate all the bull bibs. I agree. So I, I agree with him. Um, and what's really notable is like, I said those drops were hugely a result of massive leverage in the system. There's no longs to squeeze down, right? So maybe someone can push with like very little friction, but there's not like much fuel for a fire to go down. The fuel would be theory- theoretically to go up. Um, well, people are having PTSD from March 2020. I think that's fair, right? I think eight weeks feels like forever, especially when, I mean, I don't know about you guys. The The best thing about my portfolio is the USDC that I've been sitting in for ages. But like, if you took the USDC out of my portfolio, I'm down like 75% easily on what I've held. So yeah, it's, it's rough. But like we've been here before, Amazon went down 95%. Yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah, I miss my Uncle Charles, y'all. I miss his Uncle Charles too. Uh, I like Tech Nine. I like Tech Nine. Boom, 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 boom. Now tell me what you're gonna do. Ain't nowhere to hide. Um. Oh, stock market go down. Print more money. That's right. They're just gonna print more money. Is that good or bad for Bitcoin? I say good. I say good. So guys, ask some questions. I got you know. I got some time. There's no like we can look at the Ethereum chart. I guess like what's the point of that really? Uh, also, let's see. Do we have bullish divergence here? We had it. Mm, I don't know. Not quite. Not quite. Let's see. If Bitcoin's still above support, you know, we had this trade, you guys. Board, bared, board witness. We board witnesses. We had this trade, right? I remember. I ain't lying. I said that was the target. It went above, but that's the EQ of that range. It looked like it was going to flip and then it came down. But this is a fake out, right? I mean, this looks like a long right here at the EQ. Not, but it hasn't even made its way back down. And you could, with this rejection, anticipate a drop potentially back down to the range lows, but still just ranging. Just ranging. This is not scary. I want to show you something. Let me think. Let's look at the last year of Amazon, right? Since July of 2020, Amazon ranged sideways before. Oh, it broke down. Look at that. Stonk market gapping down. That's going to come back up and fill and probably hold. But anyways, like when you were here, were you bearish on Amazon? Went back up, came back down. Oh, my God, panic bearish. No, it's just ranging, right? Nobody like we all panic about Bitcoin because it's Bitcoin. But like same shit, ranging. Ranging differences, difference. Ethereum Bitcoin looks better because it's ranging high. Bitcoin's ranging after a drop. Not ideal. Not ideal. That's bearish. But Ethereum Bitcoin, this is bullish, right? It's ranging sideways, consolidating after. Some would say this is distribution, but we'll see. We will see. Ethereum USD. Uh, 
what I say? Bullish divergence. Let's just pull that. Look at that. Bull divs oversold to overbought bear divs, tapping overbought, down to oversold with more bull divs. Right? Seems fine. Seems fine. Seems fine, actually. That doesn't look that bad to me. So if Bitcoin has actually bottomed here, you could see some movement up there. But the real story everyone's talking about is the dollar, right? Because stonks go down because the dollar goes up. Same with gold, everything. Risk on, risk off. Risk on, I'll risk off. Paint a fence. Sander floor. Do you guys cry to kid? Anyone? Anyone? Risk on, risk off. Uh, so, as you know, I'm a super dollar bear. How can you not be when they print trillions of them all the time? But uh, from the Great Recession was in this massive ascending channel here on the monthly. And this was March 2020. This is when I said dollars going to die. Anyone who was with me can bear witness to the fitness. Because I said that. I said it's going to come down to the bottom of the channel. It broke, tested. So listen, this could climb and still be below support, resistance, excuse me, and drop. And we do have this potential double bottom. But this still technically a channel this size over years should continue to drop down. But take a look at the daily, which I said had looked bullish recently because we had this descending blue channel and the clean breakout and a potential double bottom. It won't be a double bottom unless it breaks above 93.437. People yell, oh, double bottom. No, you have to break the swing high between the two lows to get a double bottom. Oh, I'm uncomfortable in this chair. Get comfortable with you guys. My laptop down here, my neck's all hurting, back pains, things I do for you guys. Um, so listen, a couple ways to look at this, right? So it has to break here. It broke out of here, it retested, but now there's definitely a bit of an ascending wedge, right? Let's zoom in. And the dollar bounced, but the wrong way today, right? So you got this, if you're looking at it super locally. So as bullish as it kind of looks here, that should bring it back down to 91 if it breaks down. And maybe you have like a cup and handily here thing here. I wonder, if I don't really do divs on the DXY, but it'll be interesting to take a look. I would bet there's bear divs. There are all the way down. I don't think the dollar looks as strong as people think it does, which would bear well for Bitcoin, especially this little wick up kind of shooting star happening. Hmm. Not that worried. Not that worried about that. But like, you can't really even look at any other altcoin charts at the moment. Yeah, I agree. I agree. It's been consolidating low. What's the... Exch wait, wait, what's the exchange that you advertise that starts with an M? Matcha? Matcha. It's amazing. It, matcha, it's it's a AMM. It's like a Uniswap competitor. They advertise on my podcast. It's great because you can put in, it's like Uniswap, but you can put in limit orders and they consolidate all of their uh, orders from other places so you get the best price and the lowest gas fees. Um, so how do we trade when markets are crashing? That is the topic, right? My YouTube guy put that on there. Um, yeah, the answer is don't, right? And it, as complex as it sounds as a title, what you do when markets are crashing is you put your investor hat on, you turn your trader hat off unless you want to short, which is fine. You put your investor hat on, you plug your nose, and you start buying shit. That's what you do when markets are crashing. You sell when markets are rising, and you buy when markets are crashing. Seems so simple, but how many of you are buying Bitcoin right now? I bought Bitcoin the other day. People went nuts, like 31,000. I've already had people telling me how wrecked I am. I've lost like $400 or something um, on a 100-year investment. Um, so, yeah, I think the way that you trade a crashing market is to buy everything in sight and be extremely patient, extremely patient and calm. But instead, most people are going to sell. And that's the point, is that you don't sell a crashing market, you buy it. You dollar cost average or you buy dips, or you do both. I do both. I have automated dollar cost averaging. On vo I use, a, so on a very small level, I use round the X, which rounds up my credit cards times 10. Like if I spend 90 cents, it rounds up to a dollar, 10 cents, multiplies it by 10, and buys 
It's like when it hits a 10 bucks, it buys $10 worth of something. So every single day, like three times, I buy Bitcoin and Ethereum using around the X. So I'm buying, you know, 40, 50, $60 worth of Bitcoin and then Ethereum every single day, minimum. And then on dips, I buy like one Bitcoin at a time, you know, um, which I share those buys all over Twitter. Um, and that's my strategy for the really long term. Anytime I have extra cash, I'm taking advantage of these crashes. If I told you, hey, your favorite brand that you can't afford is on sale for 55% off, you'd go buy everything. But people don't buy assets when they're on sale because they're scared little pansies. Like I said, that's how it is. But DCA, you don't think about the price. If it goes down 25, 29K, how long do you think? I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea. But why does it matter? right? Zoom out. That's what I'm saying. Don't think short term. Don't think, hey, what happens if it's uh, between 25 to 29 for six months or six minutes? Does it matter? If you're buying for 20 years from now, I'm telling you, 30,000 looks like a massive discount right now in my mind. Uh, yeah, if you like trading, have at it, but only do it with a small percentage of your stack, right? You don't need to trade with your whole stack. If you're trading with your whole stack, you're a gambler. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm in cheers, Scott. You're one funny dude. I can do a raccoon face too. You guys have never seen this. You know, this, this, this is crazy. I shouldn't do this. I have a monkey face. It's crazy, right? Watch this. Proof of chimp. If ever you had a question about evolution, that's me. Um, yeah, buying for 20 years from now. Yes, buying for 20 years from now. I buy Bitcoin for my children. I consider it a savings account. I consider it a savings account. Uh, how do you know market token isn't overvalued anymore? Well, I mean, the market tells you the price of something, but it doesn't really tell you the value. If you believe that Bitcoin is a hedge against inflation, the value and the price are two very different things, right? Because the value of Bitcoin kicks in if the dollar hyperinflates or if there's some sort of global crisis. And yes, you might see Bitcoin dip at first with everything else, but see how it rose from March 2020 when everything else went slower, right? Thousands of percent, thousands of percent. But yes, I'm buying for decades down the road, and I think that Bitcoin is extremely undervalued. And you can look at uh, a lot of you know on-chain metrics to figure that out. I have a podcast coming out with Willie Willy Wu that will get into that, but whatever. Uh, let me see. I love people that can laugh about themselves, need character. Uh, listen, if you can't laugh about yourself, everybody else will. Is that what they say? No. Is that what it is? Um, stable coins are not money, says Fed attorney. Yeah, weird that the Fed would be talking smack about something that's a superior form of their own money. Weird. Weird. Yeah, Jerome Powell also said that we wouldn't need private cryptocurrencies once there's a central bank digital currency or digital dollar. Yeah, the government wouldn't, but the people would because we'll have no privacy, right? So uh, I don't know, man. Stable coins are not money, obviously, in their opinion. It's going to be a problem when you want to show your stable coins for a mortgage or something. But yeah. Um, yeah, Fed attorneys are not attorneys. They are politicians. That's correct. That's absolutely correct. Um, William would like you to know that he just scooped some bat. Um, sorry, I'm just looking at, uh, your comments here. A lot of people laughing at my messed up face. The dream is to have a credit card on one of the platforms like Celsius for Nexo and have them weekly payouts cover more than what you spend. Yeah. I mean, making, uh, you know, whether it's rewards or interest and paying for your life out of that is how wealthy people do it. Um, Thoughts on Bitcoin, DeFi versus ETH, DeFi. First, I think they're both DeFi. I'm a huge fan of Sovereign, which is Bitcoin, DeFi. I invested early. Uh, Pomp invested early in them um, after me, but uh, I know he like raised a $10 million group for that or something. But like, I love them. I think it's very, very, have a ton of potential, but like, let's be real. Almost all Ethereum, all DeFi right now is being built on Ethereum. So like I had said that I think they're way further ahead in the race. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people know that, um, you know, I'm very bullish on Ethereum. Scott, why do my established crypto friends hate you? You're the most informative streamer I've come across. What grudge are they holding? 
Uh, I don't know. I've heard that they don't like my face. I'm serious. I've heard that they don't like the name, the Wolf of All Streets, that it's too pretentious. Um, I've heard that it's discrimination against people with blue checks. I've heard that it's because I'm just a DJ. Um, and also I heard that's because they're haters. Um, let's see. Those who survived the dump deserve the pump. Sure. Thanks for the content, messed up face. Cool. Uh, let's see. The Fed was founded by banks and therefore not aimed at the common interests of the people. Yeah, I agree. The, 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 Fed's, the Fed's literal job at this point is to steal from the poor to give to the rich, in my humble opinion. And that's what inflation does. They print more money. It inflates the value of hard assets like stocks. CEOs and rich people who own hard assets benefit and people who do not have hard assets are stuck with dollars which lose value every year. It's reverse Robin Hood. It's exactly what it is. Um, your friends are idiots. Scott's the best. Sell your friends. I thought you were going to say tell your friends, but you said sell your friends. I don't know if it was a typo, but if you can sell your friends and get Bitcoin for them, I would do that. Guys, I don't have any animosity towards anyone. If people don't like me, they don't like me. Nothing I can do about it. But I don't even know who we're talking about, but it's not a big deal. It's fine. Uh, let me see. That damn creature from Jekyll Island. Bitcoin drop more? I don't know. What's Bitcoin doing right now? Is it dropping more? Kind of doing... I mean, when you zoom out and look at the daily, like look at how tight this is. Like we've been from 33 to 30 for like days and most of this whole time, like there's nothing happening here. I know it seems scary, but it's really not bad. Really not bad. Um, in two days, the B world holds a conference with Wood, Dorsey and now confirmed Musk. They could try to kick off the new uptrend. Maybe, but like, who cares? We know Jack Dorsey and Kathy would like Bitcoin and we know Elon Musk owns Bitcoin. I don't like I see I get it. Like it's exciting to hear them talk about it, but like they talk about it all day. They talk about it all day on, on Twitter, right? Thoughts on buying MicroStrategy stock versus buying Bitcoin directly. I think that buying MSTR is more like an accelerant, kind of similar to buying um I have a blog post coming out on this actually, like today, probably. It might actually already be up if my team put it up. But um similar to buying mining stocks. But like, uh, you know, MicroStrategy has even more volatility basically on Bitcoin moves than Bitcoin does. So it's an opportunity if you want to do it in your IRA or something like that. And you don't want to buy GBTC to buy MicroStrategy. And maybe you get a little more upside if you think the Bitcoin is going to go up. I don't know. Um, I, I think that would probably be the case. Mining stocks in the United States and North America, certainly because not only do you get the price of Bitcoin volatility up and down for the mining stocks, but you also get the fact that China is going offline. So I kind of like that better. Um, how can how can Bitcoin defend itself from hundreds of other cryptos which are literally eating it? Not sure you used literally correctly. I like you, Andre, but uh, Bitcoin does not have a mouth and will not literally be eating anything, in my humble opinion. Um, I don't think they're eating it. I think that they all have their own use cases. There's faster blockchains that are better for payments. If you accept that Bitcoin store of value is the narrative and not necessarily peer to peer cash, I don't think there's anything that competes with it. There's nothing deflationary, hard, secure in that manner. So I just disagree on that. Why so bullish on ETH? I, I, I view Bitcoin as, like I said, sort of the digital gold narrative. And I view Ethereum as the ability to invest in the internet in the early 1990s. It's a platform. Right. And we have the Internet of Information. I talk about this a lot, but we're all familiar with the way that we can send information back and forth without a decentralized party. I can email you websites, right? Nobody in the middle. You put something up. Whoever wants can read it. Direct one to one transaction between us of information. I view Ethereum as a Internet of value, everything that's be being built on it, which is much bigger. And much more important because it's a way for us to transfer value and money directly without third parties in between, which is basically impossible. And the most oppressive systems in the world are those built by the middlemen who 
stand between my transaction to you and take their tolls, right? Eliminating the toll correct collectors in a decentralized manner through DeFi is the most important thing that can ever happen, which is why I believe there's going to be more built on Ethereum and it has more upside. I still hold more Bitcoin than I do Ethereum by percentage because Bitcoin is the greatest hard asset of all time as an investment. But as a trade or something slightly more speculative, I think Ethereum has more upside. Um, yeah, Fed's reverse Robin Hood, dude. They take the money from the poor and give it to the rich. What would you do if you're trading at 10 USDT? Obviously, I can't trade the dip and I'll lose months worth of cloud mining through my phone. So I'm not really clear. Like you're saying, if you only had $10, if I had $10, I'd buy Bitcoin and wait a really long time. Um, how much of a threat do you think Fed regulation of stable coins and crypto in general can be in the US? I don't think it's a threat at all. I don't think it's a threat at all. Um, I think that it can be a temporary temporary roadblock and they can make things different, but I don't view it as a, as a threat. Exactly for this reason. The crypto genie is not going back in the bottle. Hank said it correctly. That is the absolute truth. It's not going back in the bottle. Um, uh, suggestions on how to get involved in crypto-related work. I think Pomp has like a job board. Go look for a job there, I think. Um, any updated thoughts on the potential of an ETF in the US? Yeah, I think it's inevitable. 100% going to happen. No question in my mind that an ETF is coming. It's just a matter of when. Uh, too many big players. Think about how many like billionaires now have filed for ETFs. Novogratz, Kathy Wood. I'm invested in Valkyrie, uh, Vanek. I mean, people are, there's a lot of pressure to get this done. It's being done in other countries. It's just a matter of time. The SEC is afraid, but they will absolutely have to do it. Don't you get sick of talking about this on every stream? No, I love this shit. Love it. I love it. Never get sick of talking about it. Maybe I'm weird, but no, I wouldn't be here. I, I could, you know, do other things. Do you think Facebook DM will be successful? No, I don't. Um, I don't. What is the Ethereum name service? Don't uh, know what that is. Um, sorry. Vitalik's wicked dance moves is what makes Ethereum valuable. He's a good dancer. Really good. Uh, can you tell us more about Valkyrie? Sure. So Valkyrie, um, really unique approach to the ETF. They're one of the ones who famously have filed the ETF. They're basically third. I invested in the company and I'm invested in the fund as well. Uh, alongside Charlie Lee, Justin Sun, a whole lot of athletes and a bunch of people. Um, but the reason I invested is because they had the really cool idea to form both trusts and ETFs, and they were the first to do that. So we all know about the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, GBTC, right? Behaves like an ETF, but it isn't. But an ETF destroys a trust effectively. When an ETF is approved, nobody would ever put their money into one of these trusts that trades premiums and discounts and has 2% fees. It's insane. Nobody would do it. The ETF is a superior project product. So what Valkyrie did is they created both, right? They filed for ETFs while also creating multiple trusts in, in unique ways so that they'd basically be hedged on either side. It was very cool and unique. Basically, uh, I was excited about it. So, hey, buddy, what's your take on alts right now? Do you think it's time to sell now and rebuy lower or just wait? I don't, okay, so there's two questions there. What do I think of alts? I think that there aren't many great scenarios for alts against Bitcoin right now, right? If Bitcoin rips to the upside, alts will probably go up on their USDT pairs, right? They'll make money in dollars, but they'll probably get destroyed by Bitcoin. So what are the what are the best scenarios for alts in general? When do we see them do the best, like alt season? Usually it's like Bitcoin rages. And then when Bitcoin consolidates, makes a bull flag over a long time or ranges, alts start to pop off really hard, right? Well, right now we've had this unique situation where Bitcoin dropped two months ago, alts got destroyed. And in this range, Every time Bitcoin goes up quickly or down quickly, alts get destroyed. And when Bitcoin's been sideways, alts have kind of just slowly bled, right? They haven't done well. So rationally, I'm not saying alts can't do well, but I would say that there are very few scenarios probabilistically, like statistically, where they would do well. So if they're going to do well in their dollar pairs because Bitcoin goes up, I think Bitcoin would do better, right? They'll go up because Bitcoin's going up, but they'll be but they'll do worse relative. So 
I don't see a reason if you're super into alts, like you have ones you're passionate about and you want to buy some long term as an investment. I think that's a totally reasonable thing to do right now. I just can't see trading them because just it's really difficult at the moment, I think. Um, um, and also, oh, the second half of that sell now and rebuy lower is probably the most dangerous notion in all of trading. Right. Most dangerous notion. And the reason is because when it doesn't go down, what happens? Or, okay, two scenarios. You sell Bitcoin, forget alts, right? Let's say you sell Bitcoin at 30,000. Let's call it 30,000 with a plan to buy at 25. But price goes to 28 and bounces. Now what do you do? Now what do you do? 32, 35, oh shit. 40, it's going to come back down to 25. Don't worry. 45, you buy the Bitcoin that you sold at 30 at like 50, right before it drops. <laughs> That's what happens, right? Every single time. The problem is, and then here's the other part. I'm going to sell at 30 so I can buy lower at 25. And this is this tweet that I sent that triggered so many people on Twitter. I said, price will go to 25, which is your intended price to buy. And you'll be too much of a pansy to do it because it has to go to 20 or it has to go to 15, Right. So the problem is that when you say you're going to buy the dip because you sold now, you have to actually have the balls to buy the dip and price has to actually get to where you want it. And when you put those two things together, it's something that's very, very, very difficult to do. Right. So when I, I think that 99% uh, of the time, my wife and kid just walked in there in the back. 99% um, of the time you end up selling and never buying or buying much higher right before price drops again. Right. So that, that's what I think about in general selling to buy lower. I think that maybe 10% of the time you get that right. You know? Um, so, yeah. Do you Celsius? Yes. I like Celsius. I actually, um, I interviewed uh, Alex Mashinsky on Friday again for the second time. I have like 10 podcasts recorded that are waiting to come out. I can't wait to get out. Willie Wu, Sam Bankman Freed, round two. Whit Gibbs from Compass Mining. Uh, there's so many. Mashinsky, yeah, there's so many. So many. Do you think we can have alt season till the end of 2021? We can have alt season. I think if Bitcoin goes up and chills, like I would. What if I, I could see Bitcoin breaking 42K and then ranging between like 42 and 45 and having a massive alt season? That'd be fun. Um, haha, I've been there and learned my lesson. Yeah, that's what happens when you sell to buy lower. When you sell to buy lower, you lose out your money. I have not checked out Terra, Michael. I saw the comment above. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I used to have five Bitcoin. I sold to buy lower, yada, yada. Now I have 0.8 Bitcoin. That's how, that's what happens. That's what happens. That's how it is. Um, sorry, I know it's weird that I'm like looking down. Uh, any funny Bismarck stories from your DJ? I don't have any funny stories. It's just really great, dude. I DJed them a few times. I have an epic story. Not really that epic, just a memory of Bismarck that I'll never forget. It was long before I, I wasn't even a DJ. I went to visit, I went to the University of Pennsylvania from 95 to 99. Um, I'm trying to remember, I think it was 94, but uh, um, no, it was later. I'm trying to remember, but uh, I think it was, it must have been actually after I was already, I'm, I, I saw him twice. So in like 97, he came to Penn for Penn Relays where I went to school. And Life After Death had just come out, Biggie. And like, I just remember Biz Marquis, it was like the day it had come out and he played Hypnotized by Biggie. Like, I'm not kidding. He kept just rolling it back. He must've played it like nine times in a row. He played it for like 45 minutes. It was one of the greatest DJ sets, strangely, I've ever seen. I just sit on my hands and laugh on CT Panic Attack. Yeah, I mean, people are freaking out. And what's crazy is like, price can be 31K, and people are angry and salty. Then it goes up a bit, it comes back to 31K, and they're noticeably angry and saltier. Then it goes up a bit, and then it comes back to 31K, and they're losing their minds. And it's all the same price. It's just a matter of patience. What? I don't have a prediction for Ethereum at the end of the year 2021, but you should listen. I put out a video today with uh, Nimrod Bahavi, the CEO of Simplex. Um, 
some amazing stories in this interview that we did. He had 15,000 ETH and he sold them at $1 because he was impatient. You want a lesson? He had 15,000 ETH coins and sold them at $1 because it hadn't moved. Uh, and he thinks it's going to 20, 30,000 Ethereum. I thought 10. I don't know now by the end of the year. Can you sing just a friend? Can you sing, oh, baby, you got what I need. You say he's just a friend. Do you think the housing market is leveling now? Do you think it's related to increased COVID cases? I, I, I have no gauge on the housing market because if I, I pretty like aggressively said I thought the housing market would crash last year when COVID hit and it just when COVID hit and it just went up. So I obviously was wrong. Uh, I obviously was wrong. Um, your Michael Saylor interview was amazing. Thank you. What's funny is I've said like 20 words the entire time, and that's what a Michael Saylor interview is. We had a much longer conversation, which I wish I'd still been recording like for 45 minutes after we talked for well over two hours. Um, it is really powerful. I thought what was more compelling about the Michael Saylor round two interview that I did with him was how deeply he got into how wealthy people make and keep their money, which I thought was very, uh, very powerful. Uh, yeah, we've all sold stuff. I said in the same interview, I was like, if I'd held my doge from even 2019, much less 2017, I'd have like $40 million worth of doge easily. Um, yeah, get Michael sale again. And first you ask all the questions and let him go. It's probably a good idea, but I, you know, yeah. Um, but what I thought, you know, he went on this sort of thing. I said, you know, what about he, you know, he really believes that Bitcoin's a store of value should never be spent. And I was like, I kind of said, you know, what about the payment part? And he was like, you don't need payments. If you think that you've never been rich. I was like, oh, damn, son, I feel pretty rich. But you're really rich. Um, and then he went on the tirade about lending against, you know, borrowing against all of your assets. And I said, no, I said, that doesn't work if you have $100 worth of Bitcoin. And he kind of kept going, but I don't think he got it, you know, from the perspective of like your average person in Venezuela who $50 of Bitcoin can save their lives for a month, you know? Um, so it's, it's just kind of a different situation. Um, getting a shipping container from Shanghai to Rotterdam caught 1600 in December, 2019 in May, 2020 cost $10,000. Yeah. I mean, the price of everything is insanely high. Look at what lumber did. I mean, give me a break. Lumber looks like the worst shitcoin chart in history. Ab absolutely massive pump and dump. Um, yeah, he did drop a wealth bomb. Basically, what he said was you get stuff. And the goal in life for wealth is to never sell anything and to take a taxable you know, transaction. So you never sell anything. You just borrow and borrow and borrow and you borrow at 2% and you buy something that goes up more than 2% and you literally can't lose money as long as you buy something that goes up and you never sell anything. You just take on more debt, more debt, more debt. Something you guys might not know is that long-term capital gains for wealthy people are forgiven at death. So if you have capital gains on something and you never sell it and you die and pass it to your children, those capital gains are wiped. Absolutely in Insane. Um, yeah, it's hard to get him to see that poor people exist. He pretty much said, yeah, keep working and safe. That's what I said. I said, what about a person who has $100? They can't borrow against that $100. He's like, well, you get 12 jobs. Like that old uh, In Living Color skit, you know, with the Jamaican family. Oh, lazy boy only got 12 jobs. That was basically like uh, Michael Saylor that day. Um, you think Ave building Twitter on Ethereum will happen? I saw it. I mean, isn't that what Bill Bitclout tried to do? I don't know. I think it's really cool, um, but a uh, long way out from seeing that. Literally a nicer way of enjoy staying fun. For it's, have fun staying poor. And I think he was saying have fun not being super rich. Not being super rich. Um, yeah, my kid's waking up. He's stirring. So you know what that means. It means it's my time to go. Hope that uh, you guys have had a good time. I have. I will be back Wednesday to do my chart request stream. Come hell or high water. Come red tide, dead eels, harm, harmless eels. Uh, no matter what, yeah, I'm going to be there. Love you guys. Thank you for showing up. More than anything, I know. The title was how to trade when the market's crashing. The answer is just buy stuff. Plug your nose. 
slowly dollar cost average. Don't change your plan and check it in 10 years. I guarantee you'll be very, very happy. Till next time. Peace.